Hello, welcome. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, we're not going to talk about Valentine's Day. and um, But anyway, I'm Philippa Lacey Brawl. This is the British History Channel and this is History Tea Time Chat Live. Um, is it Valentine's Day everywhere else? Let me know if it's, I don't know if anyone else um, celebrates Valentine's Day. But anyway, uh, I am streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you if you're watching live. Thank you if you're watching on the catch up and thank you if you're listening on the podcast. Um, it's very nice to have you here and thank you for supporting me and my channel. Today I'm going to talk to you about two things of more which I will talk to you about in future weeks um, to do with my visit down to London. I was down there on Friday and Saturday and um, specifically the Holbein at the Tudor Court exhibition and the uh, big history night in at Southwark Cathedral, which I attended in aid of the Papyrus Charity. So I'm going to tell you more about both of those things. Um, I can see people joining Becky, Linda, Deborah. Hi, good morning to you. Um, it's good afternoon here. So let me know where you are joining us from. And, uh, <laughs> and Jenna, hi, happy Valentine's Day to you all too. Um, can you hear me okay? Because I've got my microphone in a slightly different setup today. So please let me know if there's any problems with that. Um, so yes, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about Holbein at the Tudor Court, the exhibition which is currently on. I'm going to give you some more information about how you can see it, even if you can't get to London. Um, and also, um, oh, thank you, Becky, sound, sound is good. Um, and like I say, also just a, a bit of a uh, overview of the History of Big Night In uh, event on Saturday, which I attended, which I think you'll just enjoy hearing about. And the charity is so um, essential, unfortunately, which, so I would like to do a little bit just to, or my bit just to raise awareness of it. So, um, so that's what we'll be doing. Also, whilst I was down in London, I have recorded a podcast stroke YouTube episode with Kate Clements who is the curator at the Churchill War Rooms and that interview will come out in March um, and this morning I have been uh, recording February's historian interview and it was with Nicola Tallis. Now Nicola, um, I'll come back to Nicola in, in view of the or related to the papyrus event later but Nicola has a new book out um called Young Elizabeth Young Elizabeth Princess Prisoner Queen and the book is out on the 29th of February in the UK and actually in the US I think if you're in Australia then you might have to wait a little bit longer and it also is coming out on Audible but um Nicola wasn't quite sure when it's coming out on Audible so I have been interviewing Nicola about Elizabeth's, I suppose, life before she became queen, which is the topic within the book, asking her about why is it that, you know, with all the books out around about Elizabeth and the Tudors in more, in more generally, why was there a need for a new book? And she goes into that in our interview. Thank you if you're a member of my Patreon because you asked some fabulous questions which I put to Nicola at the end of the interview that of course um, goes into the extended ad free version of all of the historian interviews which are available via Patreon so um, thank you for that but yes yeah, so this is my interview with Nicola will be out by the end of the month so before her book is actually on sale which is rather exciting it'll give you a flavour for it as I have said a million times before, books are expensive. And if I recommend one to you, it's because I think it is a good read and worth spending your money on. Uh, and if you can listen to the historian, to the author themselves actually speak about their books, then you get even more of an insight into, into the book, into the person who's written it, and whether you, again, want to spend your money on it and your time reading it. So really looking forward to you seeing that interview. Um, 
I, I love doing my interviews with, with historians. We do do it long form, so we get into quite a few topics, and it's um, it's really exciting. Lucy says you've been a busy bee, Lucy. Honestly, that isn't even. I haven't even touched on what else I did when I was down there. I did over. This is probably not going to sound a lot to other people, but I think I did about thirteen thousand steps every day. There was another two places at least that I went to while I was down there. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I will be talking about um, one of those at least next week. So next week on my live, I will be talking about the old operating theatre in um, in Southwark. And there is a backstory to the old operating theatre that goes way back before you might even think. So um, anyway, I will go into that next week. But obviously this week, like I say, I'm going to be talking about Holbein at the Tudor Court, which is an exhibition on at the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace. And there is a way for you to see it, even if you can't make it to London. So I will I will um, let you know what that is a little bit later. Um, but um, I've, I've mentioned a couple of these things already, but obviously I, you know, uh, would love for you to support my work here and you can do that by parts on Instagram which I'm presuming you can still do even if I'm not doing it directly to Instagram anyway that's a bit technical but um hearts on Instagram and it is fun uh stars on Facebook super chats and on YouTube but the way I would love for you to support me is to come over to my patron on patreon.com forward slash British history where you get things like the extended historian interviews but you also get the chance to ask your questions to future his, uh, guests um one of which I can tell you is going to be Estelle Perron she has a new book coming out about Anne Boleyn and her time in France so she will be a guest soon and you'll be able to put your questions to her. You also, of course, get membership of the British History Book Club. And our next book club meeting is the 10th of March. And we're discussing The Palace by Gareth Russell. So you um, and also for free, but there's a there is actually a paid for version as well. But anyway, I'm on Substack, philippab.substack.com. And you get a weekly newsletter from me there. The one I've just done, I covered the killing of Margaret Clitheroe, which is something I looked into when I visited York and also that I um, I researched for my talk for the Stuarts Online History Festival happening this March um, when I'm, I'm doing a talk on the gunpowder plot. So the killing of Margaret Clitheroe and how it's linked to the gunpowder plot is in my latest substack, which like I say, you can find at philippab.substack.com. Come, um, let's get on to Holbein because that's what I promised you we were talking about. Um, and the, the exhibition which is on at the, um, here's, here's me, I'm going to show you, here's, here's me at the exhibition taking a photo of, um, you probably recognise this, the family of Henry VIII. And this is, for anyone listening on the podcast, this is the it's usually um, on display in the Haunted Gallery at Hampton Court Palace. So I was quite pleased to see it here because I could take a photo. It's so difficult to take a photograph of it at Hampton Court Palace because it's very low lit and you can't sort of stand far enough back. But this is the one where you have Henry VIII sat in the middle on his throne under a canopy and to his left is his third queen, Jane Seymour, and to his right is their son, Edward, who would become Edward VI. Of course, not um, painted from life because Jane was dead within uh, within a week of Edward being born. And uh, also included in this picture is the Princess Elizabeth and the Princess Mary. They tellingly are stood off the, the, the rug, the carpet, which Henry VIII and his let's say, immediate family are on. They're not under the canopy and they are either side of the pillars, which are also included in the portrait. And behind them are the fools um, of the court, jesters, maybe you could say. Um, so, um, so, so there's me taking a picture of that. And to the right of that uh, portrait, to the left of it was the Edward the 
sixth portrait, by the way. But you can see in this uh, photo the portrait of Elizabeth I. I would say it's my favourite. It's actually the same one that Nicola has on the front of her book. <laughs> Um, I would say it's my favourite, except there are so many of Elizabeth that I love that I'm not too sure I have one. And in Patreon, I've put some close-ups of that painting of Elizabeth I. I'll put a, I'll put more in. That's another benefit of being in Patreon. I can, um, I was going to say spam you, but that really wouldn't be very, that wouldn't be something to attract you, would it? But I put in extra bonus materials of places I've been and things I've seen. So I will actually pop in a... Uh, the photos that I took of the family portrait but I already have put in some like I say close-ups of that image of Elizabeth as princess and this is the one where she's she's holding a book she is looking at the um the artist these aren't Holbein uh by the way at least Elizabeth isn't um and and she has her finger in a book and it, it was it was to show you know sort of you know, oh, you, I don't know, you've caught me in my studies. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, diligent in my in my studies, learned, and of course she was. Um, I also put in some close-ups of there was Elizabeth and the Three Goddesses, which was an amazing painting, and it really uh, the reason I did close-ups one so you can see the detail, but um, and I'm going to show you some some of the pictures that are in. Um, in this exhibition or some of the things that are in this exhibition but in Patreon like I say I've put um, Elizabeth and the three uh, goddesses and it shows Elizabeth in one of her black and white gowns and famously if you've seen my O'Leary Lynn um, uh, interview you'll know this that famously Elizabeth said that her colours are black and white and there's an amazing depiction of a black and white dress as Elizabeth would have uh, one of Elizabeth's black and white dresses in in that picture um, so the, the, so the, there wasn't just Holbein pictures here. It brought together a massive collection, has to be said, of paintings and um, obviously, obviously Holbein sketches and his paintings, but other paintings from the Tudor court, uh, ones that he may have inspired. And also Henry VIII's armour was there, some, some of Henry VIII's armour. And... The, I'm going to mention this, the terracotta bust of Henry VIII as a boy. You may have seen this in the past. This is um, it's a terracotta bust and it's attributed to Guido Mazzoni. And he, um, and, and sorry, and this bust has, when I've seen it in the past, has been attributed, sorry, not attributed, has been um, uh, labelled as a bust of probably a young Henry VIII but they seem to have pulled back from that now and it's it's an unidentified boy. Um, I think the idea that this was Henry and the cheeky faced Henry, um, I mean maybe it was but we don't know unfortunately but that it was really exciting for me to see that bust there. Becky good question, the exhibit ends on the 14th of April um, so like I say, it's in the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace and it runs till the 14th of April, but I will let you know um, shortly. And also in the in the um, show notes, I've put a link to how you can see this online. So even if you can't make it. Um, so like I said, there's sketches, paintings, um, oh, miniatures also. There's this bust. Um, and uh, yeah, it does look a bit creepy. So <laughs> Kieran, Kieran. Yeah, I, it does look a bit creepy. Um, this look cheeky, I think. Probably creepy is a little bit more accurate. Um, now Holbein is is uh, well was in his own time and is now is since famous for his um, accurate depictions of people and. I can tell you now, and I'll show you some pictures, but obviously it's not it's quite the same as uh, seeing them in real life. They really do look like people. And I've got a, a, a like human, not a sketch of a human. It looks almost as if it could be um, could be a photograph. 
or even better than a photograph actually perspective and you know when you see photographs of people and their their faces aren't quite the same proportions and whatever because of the uh because of the lenses that we use anyway um so there's a, a couple i'm going to show you the one that i want to show you, it's an unidentified man that's very useful isn't it but i think out of all of them this was the one that made me really go oh gosh it really looks like him and it's just a sketch so this is not made into a painting um and this was behind glass so i hope that you can um if you if you if you're watching sorry if you're on the podcast i'll have to try and just explain but holbein uses um ink you can see there chalk and really brings out the features of people their mouths especially look real and their eyes of course um and this one like i said it's, it's down as unidentified man um but i took a picture of it because it really um really did pop in terms of looking like a real person i've done one quite a little bit closer um skin tone it's i don't know how it's well clearly obviously this is his genius is that he can make um a sketch look like a real person really capture capture the person um so let's let's talk about Hans Holbein and then I want to get on to the uh, before we we finish on Hans Holbein, the um, Anne Boleyn um, uh, sketch. I want to talk about that before we before we go on from Hans Holbein. So he's actually been, uh, he was a German man born in Augsburg um, around about 1497. You'll sometimes hear him referred to. Um, as Hans Holbein the Younger. That's because he was the son of another Hans Holbein who was an artist and who the younger Hans probably, um, uh, well, most likely started his training under. And he, we know that he was in Basel, Switzerland, working as a painter and a book illustrator by 1515. And by 15 to, or in 1526, he came over to London trying to seek work at the Tudor court. And one of his first patrons was Sir Thomas More. And his sketch and the portrait that he did of Sir Thomas More is in this exhibition. Um, and from that, of course, he got other work. So more work from, from the courtiers of Henry VIII's um, court came uh, became his pa patrons and commissioned paintings from him. He was also commissioned for not only portraits, but, but painting work along with a host of other artists at Greenwich Palace as well. Um, he, I don't know why, maybe someone in the comments says, but he went back to Basel for four years, but in fifth, so in 1528, he left. He came back in 1532. Um, to England, where he 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 just he stayed until his his death. He never he never went anywhere else. Um, now, of course, he's uh, so in fifteen. So excuse me. By fifteen thirty six, he was on the payroll of Henry the Eighth as one of his court painters, so salaried position. And of course, we know that he. Um, I haven't got a picture of this, but he uh, painted the famous, infamous miniature of. Anne of Cleves, um, which I think just must be a good likeness of her. Where the, I just, I just think the whole she's a, a, the ugly wife is just such a nonsensical thing. As soon as you see her pictures, just, but if if that wasn't an accurate dis depiction, then it was probably the only one that Hans Holbein ever created that wasn't accurate. Obviously, he was known for being accurate, um, and and obviously, as we know, Henry doesn't punish him. So. Um, that actually, I don't think the Anne Boleyn one was in there. So excuse me, Anne of Cleves. We'll get onto the Anne Boleyn one in a minute. But there's, um, so there was a, a raft of his sketches, um, preparatory drawings, and some of the final portraits. Um, oh, what I meant to show you, which I haven't, so I'll, I'll put it onto uh, my stories on Instagram, is the preparatory drawing of Thomas More and his portrait. And what's really exciting is they displayed the drawing of Thomas More uh, in, in glass so you could see it from the front and the back. 
And you can see, like if you've ever been to the National Portrait Gallery and seen the Whitehall mural and the cartoon of Henry VIII, you can see the dots. So these little pinprick holes that, um, that he would have used to then put on the canvas and, um, and, and use it so the dots of the outline, he would get the outline. Um, and um, yeah, so so that is that is displayed with, with 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 the final portrait of Sir Thomas More, which was really incredible to see. So, oh, before I go into the Anne Boleyn one, I've shown you there. There's the family of Henry VIII. Also, there was the field of cloth of gold and the Battle of the Spurs. Massive paintings. Um, these, do you call them a diorama? If it's not, a, I, I know dioramas as in um, uh, models, but I don't know if there's dioramas in terms of paintings. But um, so, yeah, they were there as well. Um, so let me just have a look on Instagram. Sorry for, uh, I have to switch screens now. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, so GTS Tudor says I can spam away, spam away in uh, in uh, Patreon. So I will do. Um, I think the sound on Instagram is not as good through this as um, as it will be on Facebook and YouTube. So just a heads up that you might want to check me out on YouTube.com forward slash British History instead because it's a bit. It's a bit better. I think it's better in terms of the visual and sound quality. Um, if you don't mind coming over to that, I know it's a bit more difficult to leave just running. Um, uh, Kiernan says Holbein had a special talent for drawing and painting facial hair. Yes, each strand. Well, let's just go back to this guy, this unknown guy. Um, his beard. It's just amazing. And obviously, if I if I zoom out and you can see, you know the the um sort of more the thicker ink lines but this is his sketch and yet the the hair around his his moustache his eyebrows this guy just looks real to me um it's really really good um yeah so um just as a reminder i will um i've put into the show notes the link which you can follow to do an actual virtual tour of this exhibition because I know lots of you are abroad you're not in the UK um and um or you might be in the UK and and can't get down to London so anyway in the show notes um you will find the link to the Royal Collection um uh, website which has a virtual tour of this exhibition on there so please feel free after this to go and have a look around and you can see all the others and like I say if you're in my patreon patreon.com forward slash British history then I will be probably spamming you uh with uh with more pictures from from this exhibition that I took more close-ups as well to really see the detail um yeah it, it, it was really astounding to see all these pieces in one place I have to say hmm. so have you seen this picture in the past? Again, apologies for those of you listening on the podcast, but I'm showing a sketch of a woman who looks like she has, I don't know, light brown, blonde hair, maybe. Um, quite balanced features, maybe a little bit uh, of a less than chiselled, what do you call it, jawline. And she's wearing what looks like... Um, maybe a sleeping cap, something like that. Um, oh, Melissa's seen this in real life, so good. And she looks like she's got on, she's got a high neck, uh, maybe nightshirt on, which which has little bows at the front around the neck. And, um, and what looks like fur-lined, I don't know, wash dressing gown, looks very nice. And, um, and it, Obviously, you can see uh, if you're if you're watching the Anna Boleyn or Boleyn, yeah, Queen inscription on the top. Um, and I've seen this uh, put forward, sort of as unquestioningly Anne Boleyn um, when people have posted about it. So 
I can only go by what the exhibition themselves say. Um, th that inscription um, is copied on to that later on, and it's but it's supposed to be copied from a 16th century inscription. Um, the hair colour, so if I do, I've got a little bit um, zoomed in. So the hair colour, the way Holbein um, has drawn these, obviously they're pencils, charcoal, chalk. So one of the criticisms again, or one of the questions raised about whether this could actually be Anne is that her hair's too light. Um, but the chalk, it's chalk. <laughs> and it very likely, very possibly has been um, uh, rubbed off and would have been darker when it was originally um, drawn. Um, the other thing is to say is that now I don't know the provenance of this, so I am I am guessing on, based on um, something that was in the detail of this exhibition. Though, is that when Holbein died, like I say, died in England, um, his papers went to Henry VIII. Now, whether Henry VIII sat there and looked through everything. I don't know. But if this is a preparatory sketch for uh, uh, from Holbein for a portrait of Anne, um, despite the fact that Henry tried to get rid of everything, every depiction of Anne, could it be possible that he kept a sketch of the Queen, of every Queen that he's, he's drawn, um, or forgotten about it, or just thought, well, Henry's not going to see this until I'm gone. And then if Henry had seen it, that by the time, I actually don't know when Holbein died, actually. Maybe I should have looked that up. But whether enough time had gone past that it wasn't something he felt like he had to destroy, even or maybe he just didn't see it. So I think, I, I don't know where people stand on this, Um who know more about it than I do, but I feel like it's it would be so exciting if this is actually Anne. And maybe it can't ever be said conclusively unless there's some sort of receipt that can be um, linked to it. But to think this could be Anne, I'm not sure whether it looks like we expect her to look like. That might be the only thing. Um, but that would mean we'd have this and Checker's Ring, which I think most historians now agree has uh, it, it, this um, locket ring, which Elizabeth had and was still wearing when she died. And it has a um, enamel portrait inside one of her and one of a quote unquote unknown woman who is like I say, most historians agree, is probably Anne Boleyn. That would mean we'd actually have two likenesses of her. The idea that the medal is a likeness of Anne is interesting since the nose has been smashed and not very, she's not very attractive on that. So I, I prefer, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's being silly, but I prefer um, uh, this. But she does look different. So I don't know. I don't know, but it's quite exciting to think of. So, like I say, if you look in the show notes, you'll find a link to the Royal Collection Trust website, which is um, which where you can go, you can find out more about the exhibition and you can look at their virtual tour of the exhibition as well. So like a 3D virtual tour. Um, so if you can't get there, then you can do that. Oh, Lucy says pregnant Jane, maybe. Mm, maybe. Maybe there was something. Oh, who was I talking to? Was it Leary? I can't remember who I was talking to. Who said about the the nightgown and uh, and that it could possibly and and that said that uh, this sketch somehow could possibly have been um, been Anne. So I don't know. It's just it's nice to think when we haven't got any other depictions, um, when we haven't got any depictions actually that are one hundred percent attributed to be to being her likeness that um that it would be really exciting 
to say that we've got one, but yeah. Um, oh, Kin, and that's a really good idea. The checkers rings uh, lovely. I'd like to see someone create a small portrait of it on a bigger canvas. Yes, yes. Oh, Lucy says, I'm thinking about how swollen, yeah, how swollen your face gets when you're pregnant. That's a really good, you know, let's pop it back up. Could it be an, a, a, excuse me, could it be a pregnant Anne Boleyn? Because obviously Anne has Elizabeth, but she's also pregnant probably twice more. Um, and uh, and you don't need the, the, the belly, do you, to be swollen everywhere else? <laughs> As uh, as any of us have gone through through that, no, maybe, yeah, yeah. It's very very good, um, very good question. Jenna says maybe it's a postpartum portrait of them. Yeah, it's exciting to think, isn't it? Um, so um, so that's the whole barn at the Tudor Court exhibition. The other thing I said I would um, talk to you about is the um, Southwark Cathedral. Um, event that I went to that I'm now looking for my here we go uh tales of youth a big the big history night in uh and well it's out for me out hours in fact um I didn't get home till 2 30 in the morning because the trains were being a bit of a pain but I was determined to get to this this was organized by Dr Nicola Tallis who like I say I interviewed this morning about her new book that's coming out please check that out on my channel if you, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel um, because I do put um, some really good stuff on the history historian interviews on there I am particularly proud of and like I say if you're in Patreon you get an extended and you also get it ad free but you know sorry I need the revenue <laughs> um, so um, uh, yeah, Nancy says, I love how all women here come up with the ideas that never... Well, they might not occur to male historians or they might not occur to anyone who's not been pregnant either, though. So, you know, it's one of those things. Once you... I find this. I love... I love. Um, oh, what's, what's the name for it when you do experiential sort of history? Um, you, you know, you can follow people, I don't know, who know about horses or know about fashion um, or know about... I don't know, whatever it is, and um, and they'll be able, they have insight, straight away insight into things. And we have insight into different parts of maybe someone's experience because we've experienced something similar. I've spoken about the scoliosis and Richard III thing before, uh, experimental archaeological, yeah, experimental archaeology. And um, so, what's her name? He does a lot of this. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth. Goodman does a lot of this as well so for instance she's done I'm getting a little bit off on a tangent here but she did an experiment she's done a few um with uh with linen um under garments and you know would people have smelt because they didn't wash as much well actually if they wore linen undergarments and they did wash even if it's just a you know a basin wash uh, but change their linen, then no, they probably wouldn't have smelled. Um, rushes on the floor could last something really long, like weeks and weeks, rushes on the floor could have lasted. Um, really incredible. I don't know how I got onto that, but <laughs> Tales of Youth. So, so the cathedral, um, there were 12 historians plus Nicola who had organised it. And the night was to raise awareness and money for a charity called Papyrus. Now, it's a UK-based charity, and I realise that there are uh, many people watching um, uh, here today who, who aren't UK-based. But I did want to raise – well, I want to tell you about the, the night because it was fun, but also uh, just mention the Papyrus thing because it's a charity that's been uh, that's set up to – it. well, in the – in the aid of, of preventing youth suicide and it's uh suicide is the biggest killer of people under 35 in this country now which is just incredibly well, incredible incredibly sad um and um so I'd bought my tickets and even if I couldn't have gone that was fine by me um but I did manage to go so if you if you want to look at papyrus 
um, then you can, again, I've put the link in the show notes. Um, you can have a look, you can access their services, or if anyone you know needs to access this, their services, you can also donate. Um, so, but there's 12 speakers, so get this, right? So I sat there and I, Gareth, obviously Gareth Russell, my my dear friend and amazing, um, a, a incredible historian, and he's also my tour historian. So if you want to meet Gareth in person and spend days with him discussing history, please do look at BritishHistoryTours.com um, and come on a, a tour with uh, with me that, and him. <laughs> uh, so Gareth was speaking, Tracy Borman, who also speaks on my tours. Um, she spoke about how to raise a royal. It was very, it was a very funny, a very fun um, and funny talk about just the, uh, the 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 pitfalls of being a royal, trying to raise children throughout time, and where some of them did well, but most of them didn't. <laughs> it was quite funny. Yanina Ramirez, um, who um, so she she was talking about how her book well, it was sort of based on her book Femina and rediscovering women's history um and how that can help sort of shape um a, a, be a better future because we can understand better from where we came um her book I've got it on audible so I really uh, really must get into that but what one of the things that I was, was in I was interested in that she was saying was how it's it's I think, well, she didn't say this in so many words, but I think there's basically a block between uh, where sort of women's history didn't get through um, in terms of what was bothered to be written or rewritten or printed or retold or whatever. It's not that women weren't active in all sorts of things. Um, so she spoke about a warrior grave. Um Sorry, off the top of my head, I can't remember the the detail about it. But a, a, a grave that was assumed to be just assumed to be a male warrior, and then the DNA was done on it, and it was an XX chromosome skeleton, and yet the skeleton had been buried as a warrior. Um, not much else known, I don't think. But anyway, um, that was fascinating. Helen Carr. Um, talked about what is history now and if you follow her on Instagram she's been posting extracts from her her talk I've got an interview with Helen Carr on my uh, YouTube channel if you've not seen that she wrote a book called The Red Prince about John of Gaunt if you don't think you want to know not necessarily interested in him I can assure you you will be watch the interview read her book he's fascinating his life is fascinating so Helen anyway though has also written a book called What is History now, it's actually a follow on from her grandfather's book, E.H. Carr, who wrote What is History? Uh, great grandfather, sorry. So she was talking. Then there was a lady called Lara Maiklim, who's a mudlark. So she's one of she's one of these people who goes down onto the Thames, uh, onto the foreshore at, uh, on the, along the Thames and looks for what they can find. And she spoke about... Um, because this is this was a the, the the running theme was tales of youth. Obviously, that was the name of the uh, of the event. And she spoke about Victorian children who they were mudlarks by necessity. She does it out of obviously as a hobby, um, and but they were having to do it out of necessity, and it was harrowing. It was harrowing, um, but incredibly interesting um, as well. Greg Jenner, who some of you might know from Horrible Histories, and he's also been on TV quite a lot. Uh, he was talking about how he brings together comedy and history. Uh, if you haven't watched Horrible Histories, please do treat yourself. Um, just look up look up Charles II's song, Horrible Histories. Look up Boudicca's song, Horrible Histories. <laughs> look up all the songs for a start. Uh, and then a little bit of a surprise for me, because I hadn't heard of this guy before, but I am really hoping to get him on for an interview. Dr. Jonathan Healy spoke about um, the young people uh, around, so apprentices, people like that, who were around during the, the English civil wars and their impact on 
the on on the civil wars that was fascinating very funny as well um so i think he would be a great guest kate williams talked about um mary queen of scots and then we had dr steve cross who's actually a doctor what's he say he's a doctor in he's not a doctor in history uh because he didn't know a lot about history but he was a comedian so he was like just look at look at the year 66 whenever whenever you think something if something major happened it's probably something 66 1066, 1666, although we did get the year of the Great Plague one. But anyway, then we had another uh, um, speaker who's been a guest on my podcast, Dr. Jo Joanne Paul. Um, she wrote The House of Dudley, again, a book you must read if you're interested in the Tudor period, because I would say there's a few of these books that I can recommend to you that look at the Tudor court, especially the Tudor monarchs from a different angle because they're not, these books aren't telling their story. They're telling someone else's story and you get a, back, a view back towards the Tudor court and the Tudor monarchs. It's in a different way to you know, the books that are probably are written just about, about them as the focus. But Joanne did a talk about the Dudleys about the, the treason um, and uh, the, so basically the, the ups and downs. But again, you can see my interview with Duran Paul if you're interested in that on this channel. Gareth, my friend Gareth, wonderful man. Um, Gareth Russell spoke about the monster of clams. Now, if any of you have read uh, his book about the Queen Mother, Do Let's Have Another Drink, um, 101. What does it? What does he say? One hundred and one. Um, they're not quips, but they're sort of short stories about the Queen Mother, one for each year of her life, um, which um, uh, talks so gives amazing insight into her her life, her personality, the people around her, the, her times. She lived for one hundred and one years. All right, so if you haven't um, picked up that book, I would I would recommend that one. Um, and you can also read it in bits so you don't it's sort of it's a good coffee table book actually because you can you can pick it up and and read bits out of it and he talks about the monster of glams which was a um so glams glams was the um uh, family seat of elizabeth both lyons uh, family and there was this legend of the monster of glams and he spoke about that there is a um like i said in his book he talks about this as well and he spoke about that and how it seems so so the, the sort of there's a sort of a legend that the real heir at one point was um a child born with horrific disabilities i suppose and they were kept away um and this is some, some sort of secret that that once the public heir if you like came of age they would be in on the secret but that he thinks this sort of there's a mixture of two sort of legends sort of coming together with this one but also spoke about the ghosts at glams and how the queen mother and her family um sort of they prayed for them every day in the chapel they prayed for these ghosts they weren't scared of them it was really insightful. It's really, really incredible. Um, Becky, did they video the talks? They didn't, I'm afraid. So I, of course, would recommend that you go and watch the interviews with at least the ones that I, well, the ones that I've managed to interview out of this list, um, because I think I've got recent interviews with all of them. Um, and the finisher was Nathan Armin and Matt Lewis with the Who Done It, the ultimate Who Done It. Or did well? Or did it even happen? The prince is in the tower, because now it, now it's not even just who's done it. It's well, was it actually done? Was it actually done? So Nathan and Matt had it out. <laughs> Apparently, they've done it six hours already this week. It's a very popular topic at the moment, um, and there is um, I have got an interview. In fact, Matt Lewis was one of the first people I interviewed on my channel. We're at Ludlow Castle. And he's talking about the Wars of the Roses and what happened at Ludlow. Um, so you can check out that. It's one of my first ever interviews. Um, and Matt Lewis was 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 the speaker. He's was, he was brilliant. And I'm hoping to get Nathan on really soon as well. I just need to read his book first, which is Henry the Seventh and the uh, Tudor Pretenders. I've got it over there somewhere. So it was a, ma a major lineup. Absolutely brilliant. 
um and just um it was poignant at times because like i say the the charity that the um, nicola was raising awareness uh, for is a suicide a youth suicide prevention charity based in the uk um and uh, unfortunately very sadly there is a huge need for these services uh here i don't know about the rest of the world but i imagine post pandemic um and uh yeah for a certain age group at least um there is a a need at the moment so uh so it was it was a real honor to to be able to to attend um yeah Davis is in the us too so hopefully you know with these with the these kind of events and people um supporting them um yeah we'll have more available to people um as and when they want to access that kind of help so i'm not back tonight there's no had tonight if you normally catch history after dark then um i'm afraid tonight we're having a little night off i'd like to say it's for valentine's day um I could just pretend it's a Valentine's Day and we've all got hot dates, but um, actually, cat's working, so, <laughs> so that's why we're not we're not doing it. Um, we will be back next week, though. If you haven't checked out History After Dark, then please do. If you're brave enough, come along. We have a live stream every Wednesday at quarter past eight at night UK time. Um, we're on the History After Dark channel. You will see that there's a live stream already scheduled for next week. So you can click the is it a bell to get the notification um, and to get a reminder of when we go live. So, um, so we'll be back next week, but no had tonight. And next week here on, uh, on History Tea Time Chat Live, I will be talking about the old operating theatre and its history and how it goes back to a legend, a, a interesting legend to do with the River Thames. So I will take you all through that. Um, also, do sign up to my newsletter, philippab.substack.com. Or is it .co.uk? I'll put the link in the show notes so that it doesn't matter if I... <laughs> Get what it actually is. Last week, like I say, I, I covered, um, among other things, the killing of Margaret Clitheroe. The week before, what did I do the week before? I wrote it down. I did something the week before. Oh, the um, Midlam, Middleham jewel. So this, uh, I'm doing this like it's a pendant. It probably wasn't, but it, it might have been. Uh, Middleham jewel that possibly belonged to the Queen of Richard III and Neville. So if you go to my Substack, you will be able to see the previous ones. You also, if you sign up for that, will get a notification um, when, because I upload my podcast to Substack and then it goes out to Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all the other places, but you'll get a notification to let you know that they're live. So that's always worthwhile. And if you really want to, um, you and you don't want to become a patron, you can actually pay for my Substack and get the exclusive blogs which go into patreon you can get those as well and you also get um early access to the historian interviews podcast version basically i'm just trying to give out stuff um and thank you so much for your support back it helps it means that i can carry on uh and eat and drink and get my hair cut like you may have noticed becky any update on new tours they're all in the pipeline. And as soon as I can reveal why there's been a slight delay in getting 2025 out, I will tell all. Um, and it won't be long. It won't be long. There will be an Anne Boleyn tour 2025 that will run from the 16th till the 20th of May. So anyone who wants to do the Anne Boleyn tour, please do email me at office at britishhistorytours.com and we will put you on the waiting list um if you are a member of my patreon you get seven whole days to book on to any new tour before anyone else and that's important because some of the tours 
sell out incredibly quickly, but also we have a limited number of upgrades for things like rooms and, uh, and other such things, which, uh, which just by virtue of the number of rooms available are limited. So you get first dibs on all of that as well. So it's worth it. It's worth it. But yes, we ha I have some very interesting ideas for 2025 tours, but I will reveal all and why there's been a, uh, well, it's not really a delay, but I could have got them out already, um, except for something I've been doing, which I'll tell you all about as soon as I can. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Oh, um, Kiernan, if someone could subscribe to one, would you prefer we join Patreon or YouTube? I prefer if it's a paid one, because you can also upgrade on YouTube, but Patreon. Patreon is the one I give the most um, stuff back on, um, and you can pick it up as and when you want because it's on the uh, app or you can access it on your desktop. Um, like I say, extra pictures from places I go, exclusive blogs, the ability to ask historians your own questions and book club. Book club is just fun. So our next book club meeting, 10th of March, we're discussing The Palace by Gareth Russell. So um, yeah, Ken, and if you want to join one Patreon, I would say it would be the one I would suggest. Uh, and I would love to see you in there. All right. So thank you very much, everybody. I will see you here same time next week. And had History After Dark will be back next week. I apologise that we won't be here tonight. Um, hopefully you've got something else you can do. Maybe watch my back catalogue if you, if you want to. All right. I'll see you all very soon, everyone. Bye bye.